Sudakhire Chaturi Salam Tashakur. I'm going to start this morning. Unfortunately, I cannot do this in Farsi, but I will try to make this hopefully helpful for you, even if you don't do Asian eyelids. It's a way of thinking uh, and a way of approach. We're going to divide this lecture into two parts. The first part will be how to do it, and the second part is going to be how do you approach an aging Asian eyelid. So first we have to define beauty in the Asian. In people that are not Asian, you can have either a very high defined crease and still look beautiful, but I would argue that in almost every Asian, the crease is low and the contour is full. So you don't want to lift the brow high, cut away a lot of skin, and create something that doesn't look right. And you may not have the aesthetic eye to see that, but I want to help you see that beauty in the Asian can be similar to the non-Asian, but it can also be quite different. So how do you approach someone that's aging? Well, we're going to talk about that as a second part of the lecture. First, we have to understand what is unique to the Asian eyelid. Not every Asian eyelid is different. A lot of them are the same, but the ones that don't have a crease have this very puffy eyelid that's with a very small palpebral fissure, in other words, eye opening. And the reason for that is since the levator muscle doesn't insert into the skin, the fat slides down and creates what is known as pseudotosis. In other words, they don't really have ptosis. And what you find is if you move that fat out of the way and you create a crease, they actually have a more open eyelid. This is a this is from the book I wrote about 10 years ago with John McCurdy, who's passed away, and he's developed this technique, so I give him credit for it. But today I don't make medium or high folds anymore. This term westernization I think is outdated because I think people look weird with it. So there's a couple different eyelid creases you can make. The top one is called an inside fold with an oval configuration. In other words, it ends inside the epicanthus and opens up, and the bottom one is a parallel crease or round, cre round formation with an outside fold. In other words, you don't see it terminating immediately into the canthus. So let's talk about how to do it. First, you want to mark it out. I usually mark up about seven millimeters, and that's done with the eyelid under tension with the, with the eyelashes at about 90 degrees with gentian and violet using a castor veo calipers, and I usually take about three to four millimeters of skin away. This is showing the, the design of an inside fold with an oval configuration, and under tension you can see this. We need to put local anesthesia in. With a little trick, if you put some benzocaine, lidocaine, tetracaine, or topical anesthesia, they don't feel anything. It's really numb when you anesthetize them because the skin is so thin on the eyelid. If you put cream on the face, they still may feel it, but they don't even feel the needle. But I do give them a little IV sedation. That's because I have a certified center. It just makes them a little bit more at ease, but obviously you don't need that. This is one cc of marcane, 50% mar or 0.5 cc's of uh, quarter percent marcane and 0.5 cc's of 1% lidocaine to 100,000 epinephrine, in other words, 50-50 mix. And the trick with this is you need to use the same amount on both sides, use very little, I usually one cc, and you don't want to thread it through the skin because you're going to get a hematoma and then you're not going to be able to read symmetry. So I just spot injected, and this is courtesy of my colleague in uh, Korea, Dr. Kim, Dr. Young Kun Kim, who taught me this, and then you just squeeze it and you'll get an even uh, distribution of it with minimal chance of hematoma. Then uh, after you made your skin incision, you don't make it deep because there are going to be vascular arcades that run parallel or sort of perpendicular to the skin and you want to cauterize these with your cautery obviously near the skin island so you don't damage the skin before you start causing bleeding. The less the bleeding you have, the better when you're dealing with an Asian island. I take the skin envelope, skin island out then I take a strip of the sort of pretarsal uh, abicularis out and I take it along the inferior margin of the incision. The reason I do that 
is so that that way I can make my fixation crease at the same height on both sides and that allows you to create better symmetry. The landmark of safety is the orbital fat. If you see that, you know that you're going to be safe. You're not going to injure the levator. And there's more of it laterally. So I have my assistant press on both sides of the eyelid to sort of help herniate the, the, the fat. And I make a small fenestration or window through the, uh, through the tissues. And until I see that fat herniate, I'm not moving forward. I really want to make sure I see fat. And I know that I'm safe. I'm not going to hurt the levator. This is, then I gently open up with prongs or mosquitoes, making sure I don't injure anything. I'm always looking for the fat below me. I cauterize it to make sure there's no bleeding in that uh, preceptal tissue. And then I just incise it and open it both directions all the way. I rarely take out fat today because as you heard my, in my lectures, I don't believe that, that removal of fat is, is rejuvenative. It can be bad. And remember that earlier slide when I showed you that pseudo herniation is the problem, or excuse me, pseudotosis where the fat is sliding downwards. All you've got to do is reposition it. And I do that in about 95% of cases. In some South Koreans that I've, I've worked with, they have a very exuberant or excessive amount of fat and then I'll take a little bit out because that can actually block you from a good fixation. So if you've got a lot of fat, take some out, but don't get in the process of thinking that fat is a problem. The fat position being too low down on the ciliary margin is the problem. You just need to move it up. You don't necessarily have to take it out. Then you create your fixation creases. I use a 5 nylon riding through the inferior lip of the skin, through the mid-pupillary area. Then I run it horizontally through the levator process and I go right sort of the inferior aspect. And the reason I want to do that is so I keep the same level on both sides and it helps me make sure that my uh, crease will be even and at the same height. Then I ride up the 5 nylon through the superior aspect of the wound and I tie it down with one knot to make sure that there's a proper reversion. What I'm looking for is the eyelashes should be about 90 degrees up. If I see it over-reverted or I see the actual margin of the eyelid over-pulled over out, it's going to create problems. If it's under, then it's no good. So that's what I'm looking for. And then what I do is I do the same thing on the other side. And I alternate cre these crease fixations from mid-pupil, then uh, an area at the lateral limbus, and then at the la near the lateral canthus. And I just go back and forth for approximately five to eight sutures on both sides until I'm happy with the uh, the symmetry that I'm seeing. Once I've done that, I just close it with a running 7 nylon. I take all of that out at seven days. So there's no permanent fixation creases there. Um, of note, I used to do partial incisions. I used to do suture techniques. I had problems with those. Suture techniques, things fell out um, toward a year or earlier. I used to do partial incision techniques. In the partial incision, I had to hold, I had to hold, hold my breath and hope the, the crease stayed because I was waiting on these little permanent sutures not to fall out. Um, I also, sometimes you could see the permanent suture uh, in these very thin upper eyelid skin. Or the other problem I would have is that because you're using a small incision, you think, well, I'm gonna make a small incision, that's gonna be great because it'll be, a, it'll be less trauma to the patient. And yes, you'll have a shorter recovery time. But the real problem with it is that you can see the terminus or the ending of that crease. But when you make an incision all the way across, you typically hide that crease so well that the person, even with their eyes closed as it heals, you should not be able to see it. So I'm a very strong proponent of the full incision method, even though it leads to longer recovery. What's a recovery like? Well, this is the problem. I think that's the thing that I try to underline for a patient when they come to see me for this procedure is you will have a longer recovery time. So this is an example of a lady about a month in the middle and then toward a year at the bottom. So you still see there's this pretarsal edema or swelling that looks abnormal, doesn't look right. And so you need to tell these patients that. How do you get around it? With women, it's actually a lot easier because you can put, you can put uh, mascara, you can put eyeliners, you can put things that, that make it harder to see. I advise patients to wear low black frame glasses that frame over the eye, especially for men. And to do that, if you don't have glasses, to start wearing them maybe even a few months into it before the procedure, that is, so that it doesn't look so obvious on the aftermath 
For example, this is a week after, very typical. If you see this a week out, you did not do a, uh, make a mistake. It should look way too high, it should look weird, it should look edematous, and that's normal. These are photos a year out. I'm sorry there's a little bit more makeup on the after, but that's one of the reasons people do this because they can put makeup on that crease, and so it's easier to do that. This is about a year out as well, and you can really see that it's a very subtle aesthetic, and that's the thing that I want to emphasize to you. I don't think Asians look good, that's my personal bias, toward a very, very high crease. It looks weird. Let's finish this talk with some universal concepts of what if an aging Asian person comes to you and says, make, my, make me look young. What are the mistakes that you can make? Well, these are the things that I, these are the mistakes I've made that hopefully that you will avoid. And so I've published this, if you want to get this summarized, um, in two places. One is in a clinic uh, of facial plastic surgery that I edited about two years ago and I wrote a, uh, wrote a chapter in, uh, in that as well. And it's also in the upcoming book, I think it's just coming out now, uh, Art and Craft of Facial Surgery or something by Hoiger Gassner and uh, Wayne Larrabee. So just two places you can find it. So how do, I, how do you mentally divide this? I divide the, the person coming to your office into three categories. Category one, an Asian that is born with a crease. Category two, an Asian that's born without a crease. And category three, an Asian who's had a crease made before. And if you divide them into these three categories, you're gonna have an algorithm or a strategy that's gonna lead you to safety and not create problems. Let's take category one, a person born with a crease. Um, here's an example of a lady that comes to you, she looks tired, your first gut is maybe a brow lift and eyelid surgery. Well, that's what I did for her. This was many years ago. And I would argue that this doesn't look that good. I think it would look good maybe in a, in a, in a non-Asian, but to be honest with you, I don't even believe in this aesthetic for uh, non-Asians. But still, I think it, it, it takes that ethnic look and changes the person to something that doesn't look quite right. So how do I make a decision with, a, with an Asian with a crease? If the crease is sitting at the ciliary margin, at the eyelash margin or below, I, I would take a little skin away. And I almost always will add some filler or fat, and here's the reason why. Besides rejuvenation, it maintains and preserves the crease height. Okay, so I repeat that. When you take skin away, it raises the crease and it can look fake, and you may want to put some volume, fat or fillers, to maintain or lower the crease height. You do not want a high crease height in an Asian. It doesn't look right. So that's the decision. If you have a person with, a, with a, a natural crease already there, they're born with it, you can ask them. That will help you create a result that I think will look na natural for the person. What if someone comes to you without a crease? I think you have two options. One of the options that's not allowed, in my opinion, in my opinion, again, you can have maybe great success, and these are just biases that I have, which is I don't believe you should just take away skin. If you take away skin, you're probably not going to see a big change, and the reason you're not going to see a big change is that they already have this pseudotosis. You're not going to do much from. And the second problem is you can't hide the incision anywhere because the crease will not form. So then you say, well, I'll take some fat out and just randomly just take some fat out. Well, then you have this, you have this incomplete post-septal adhesion, and you may have an incomplete crease. It's bad. So if you have an Asian coming to you without a crease, I would encourage you, don't just cut out skin and almost definitely don't take out fat. If you're gonna do it, you have one of two options and here they are. Number one, make an Asian eyelid. If you don't know how to do that, send it to, an Asian, uh, send it to a colleague of yours. But the main problem with that is that it adds a lot of recovery time and it also changes the way the person looks in a way, right? because they're going to have a much more open eyelid. And they're 20 years old, they came into, it, came into you for that, easy. But if they're 55 years old, they go, I, I never look like this, I don't want that, then you got to be careful. So the other way I do this, now with this eyelid on the left, I don't think there's almost any other option I have but to create a crease. But if they have, you know, not too much sag, I'll actually put a little bit of fat into the, the eyelid because remember, I know that sounds counterintuitive or doesn't make sense to you, but it actually will round out the contour and make them look like they did at a younger age. If you have a confusion about that, go back and look at that photo when they were at 30 or 40 and see where their eyelid, what their eyelid looked like and see if you can reproduce that. So those are the some ideas. I know this is complicated. I know it's hard to really remember this algorithm clearly, 
So I encourage you to try to pick up the chapter I wrote or the book that, um, from Dr. Gassner that may give you a little bit more insight and more detail, but these are just, a, this is an overview. This is an, a, a lady that on the top image looks like all she needs is some skin removal. But if you look at her very carefully, it, the eyelid still doesn't look quite right. And the reason is she actually had the old westernization procedure with a lot of fat removed and a lot of skin removed. But over time, she's had the dermatocolasis, or in other words, the skin hanging down, and it's actually covered everything up. When I take that skin away, I re-reveal that old westernized look, that br thick brow skin sitting unnaturally over the thin eyelid skin and it looks wrong. So what do you do with a person that's had previous eyelid surgery, especially if it's old style? Well first look and lift up and see where it is. If it looks like a lot of skin's been removed and you lift up the brow they look weird, don't take more skin away or be very conservative and very careful. And this is an argument that I would say again with a personal bias is consider adding fat or adding fillers because I think this looks good. If, if the person is unclear whether volume would look good, clearly don't start with fat. Maybe do something that's reversible like Juvederm or a hyaluronic acid based product. Here's an example of a lady that looks very clearly like she needs to have skin removed and a brow lifted. But I, all I did was add fat. So I've, I've filled it out and I think it looks better. Now I could, you could argue she could take a little skin away, but I was able to get away with this without skin removal. This is a lady you can see that has a lot of this redundant skin and a pretty low crease uh, position near the slurry margin. So I took some away and then I added fat back into the, into the face. This is my own mother. And she has, looks like she's had an eyelid surgery because she's had this high crease. This is actually just real ptosis where she's actually had disinsertion of the levator. So it's not perfect. I didn't do a ptosis repair, but I just added a little fat back, lowered the crease, and I think she looks better. This is a book I wrote uh, many years ago with uh, uh, my mentor, Dr. McCurdy, um, and I honor him with this uh, slide. So going back, I really encourage you, before you start working on Asian eyelids, understand the aesthetic. Go look at what is considered beautiful and youthful Asian eyelids, and that's a starting point. And I always end my talks with having you challenged to be more artistic in the way you see the world rather than mechanical. Thank you, Tasha Kaur. What a fist.